Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whenever you're joining us right here at Restoration. So glad that you're with us as we continue on in our series on the Tabernacle Prayer, looking at today on the Golden Lampstand. So let somebody know that Restoration is on the air, and if you're watching this live Sunday, maybe we have time to get down to City View Church of God in Dalton, Georgia, where I'm preaching in the morning service. But if not, stay tuned right here. Let somebody know. Get them a cup of tea. Get your Bible out. As we go into the Bible, where this ministry is dedicated to helping you become the living letter to a dying world. We'll be right back. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, this evening, this afternoon, whenever you're watching, we're going to continue talking about the tabernacle prayer. Now, I want to again be clear just because you pray a tabernacle prayer or you pray the Lord's Prayer, whatever, it's not so much that it's going to get you a, a special benefit or a special dispensation. What it simply is to do is to help you focus your thoughts, focus uh, your attention on prayer. Jesus asked the disciples, could you not tarry one hour? Larry Lee, back in the 90s, wrote a book called um, Can You Not Tarry, where he took the Lord's Prayer and, and expanded it out. We've had prayer. The disciples even asked Jesus, hey, can you teach us to pray? And prayer needs to be a conversation between you and the Heavenly Father. However, many people struggle. Uh, their minds begin to wonder. They start to pray, oh, did I turn the oven off? Did, what time do I have to pick the kids up? <laughs> Is my phone going to ring? And all of the things that change. But I want us to get to the point that we are naturally supernatural, that the, nat the normal Christian life is to see God move in our families, in our personal lives, in our families, that we truly go after the crucified life. So this sermon today talks about the golden lampstand. Now, as you know, we the tabernacle itself, the walls were surrounded by the, the salvation of the Lord, the only gate is through praise in Jesus Christ. You come upon the cross, the brazen altar, where the blood was spilled, and when we are to be living sacrifices, you come. we came to the labor where we are washed in the word. And as we go into what's called the holy place, not the most holy place, but the holy place, we will find three pieces of furniture. You will find the golden lampstand, the table of showbread, the table of the presence, and the altar of incense. Today, we are going to begin looking at the golden lampstand. Now we start off as always in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 1. Now even the first covenant had its own rules and regulations for divine worship and it had a sanctuary but one of this world. And then in Exodus chapter 25 verses 8 through 9. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them and you shall make it according to all that I show you the pattern of the tabernacle or dwelling and the pattern of all the furniture in it. So we know we've, we've talked about this before that the tabernacle layout is to mirror the one that's in heaven because God wanted to dwell or tabernacle among his people. And if you look at how it was designed, how they were to camp around the tabernacle, it kind of looks like a cross. The tabernacle, the presence of God, was the center of their life. In the same way, the presence of God should be the center of our lives. However, we've made denominations, we've made everything else, but what God said to be the center of our lives. So I want to talk about this golden lampstand today. Now, the instructions for it were given in Exodus 25, uh, 31 through 40. And, I, and you know, it looks kind of, it's going to look like a menorah for all of you that are going, what's that going to look like? It's going to look like a menorah. But I want to look at in Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Zechariah has a vision of a golden lamp. Look what he says. Now, the angel who talked with me came again and awakened me, like a man who was wakened out of his sleep. And said to me, What do you see? I said, I see, and behold, a lampstand, all of gold, with its bowl for oil on the top of it, and the seven lamps on it. And there are seven pipes to each of the seven lamps, which are upon the top of it. And there were two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl, and the other on the left side of it, feeding it continuously with oil. So Zechariah, in a vision, sees this golden lampstand. And when the Lord asks him repeatedly, what does it mean? He finally says that when it's a scripture, we all can quote, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The golden lampstand is that light that gives us light 
in the holy place. It gives us the light to see. It's the Holy Spirit being fed constantly by the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the lamp was to be burning 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Notice what he says in Leviticus chapter 24, verses 2 and 3. Command the sons of Israel that they may bring to you clear oil from beaten olives for the light to make the lamp burn continually outside the veil of testimony in the tent of meeting. Aaron shall keep it in order from evening to morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. That's why the psalmist will pray in Psalm 18 and 28, for your cause my, you cause my lamp to be lighted and to shine. The Lord my God illuminate, illuminates my darkness. Uh, I saw another translation that says, keep my light burning. The lamp was supposed to always burn because it represented the light of God's word, the presence of God, and it was to be there all the time. If you're familiar with the story of Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 2 through 3, we see that Eli was had gone blind physically to the point he did not see that the lamp was about to go out. And he, that meant he was also probably blind spiritually, that he didn't realize how bad things were. So many times in our own lives, in our own place, we've allowed in denominationalism, we've went from the illumination of the spirit to the externals of what we do. I've been reading A.W. Toza's book, The Crucified Life, and he talks about that in almost every revival, it starts off from the illumination from somebody from within, but by the time it gets over, we're now trying to do the externals. Maybe if we sing the right song, uh, if we preach the right message, if we hold our mouths just right, something will happen. But it's the light that's supposed to be there. This light was in the holy place where the showbread was and illuminated everything inside and it was being fed with the oil. It, fed, it showed them where the table of showbread was, the table of the presence of God. We'll talk about that next week in the bread of heaven. And it illuminated the altar of incense where prayer and praise would go up before the, holy, the most holy place. We need to understand that all of the symbolism is to be regulated or really true in our own lives. God is calling the church, especially in the days. He says, arise and shine for your light has come. As the, light, as the world gets darker, we should shine brighter. Yet with all the scandals and things going on, the church tends to retreat. It is time that we stand our ground. It is time that we let the light shine. The lamp was filled with oil to constantly feed the anointing of that lamp so that it would light. And it would give them light, and it gives us light in scriptures. It gives us light for God's will and God's voice. It, this holy, The Spirit wants to illuminate every part of your life. But sadly, many of us would prefer just to let's not let God start talking because he might call me out. But the light was to expose everything, there would be no dark corners. So let's go to the New Testament. You say, well, brother, this is all great, but we don't have a tabernacle, and I'm not going to convert to Judaism. Not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this, look at the application. Who is the light in the New Testament? Well, in John chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. The one following me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of, in the Greek that would mean proceeding from or leading to life that the light Jesus gives us leads us to life, leads us to the place where we walk in that light. He is our light. In John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, in him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And the light is shining in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome or overtake or overpower. All the forces of darkness did not overcome the light, or grasp or comprehend the darkness. The unbelieving people did not understand the light. In other words, they didn't comprehend who Jesus was when he was there. And there are many people even sitting in church today who don't comprehend who Jesus is. Didn't say was, I said is. He is the resurrected Savior, and that he is the light of the world. He is who we are supposed to be lifting up high and lifted up. Not a political candidate, not a denomination, not a thought system, not a belief system, but Jesus Christ and him crucified, risen from the dead, and soon coming back. When we get back to the place that that is the light we show, he is the one that we hold up in the wilderness of this world. 
You see, we understand that the world is going to get darker and darker and darker before the return of Jesus. But we also understand that something's going to happen to bring one last great move of the Holy Spirit before the church leaves. Once we leave, his light doesn't go out. But once we leave, the whole kind of thing changes and the, and the focus goes back to another position. When you uh, grasp the idea, you and me are the light of what people need to see and coming out of us. The glory, we should be a lampstand. In other words, we're so full of the anointing that his spirit comes out of us. That it's the Shekinah glory of God shining out of us that people don't see us anymore. In Luke chapter 1 and 79, it says this, So as to shine upon the one sitting in darkness and a shadow of death, that he might direct or lead or guide our feet into the way of peace. Jesus wants to give you the light on how to walk. Amen? But we live in a world that's all about the me. We are a narcissistic society hung up on the me. What I get, what I deserve, when what we deserve is hell, what we deserve is death. And we live in darkness. That's why the Bible says that the preaching of the gospel is foolishness because their minds are darkened. The, the enemy of our soul, the, the prince of this world, now as I said prince, not king. He's not the king of this world. And he only can control those who are still under his power. And their minds are darkened so that they cannot see the light of Jesus Christ. So we are empowered, we are told in Scripture that it is up to you and to me to go out and be the light, to shine that light. So look what 2 Corinthians 4 and 6 says, Because God, the one having said, Light will shine out of darkness, is he who shined in our hearts for to create in us the illumination consisting of or produced by the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Jesus told the disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In Exodus chapter 28, Moses asked, he says, hey, can I see your glory? Can I see your glory? And when we get to the point that that becomes our focus, I don't want to see the big house on the hill or the BMW in the driveway. I don't need to see all of these other things. I just want to see that light, the glory of the living God through Jesus Christ. And if that's all I'm looking at, we see in Moses, once he was exposed to that, he was so changed that people, when he would walk around, that they had to cover his face because of the glory of God that was on him. How would this world, your workplace, your family, your school, the shopping center, wherever you go, how does it change if you were covered and exhorting and showing out the light of God? If you go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, you see that Jesus is walking among the seven golden candlesticks the seven churches who were supposed to be the light to their world. The church was supposed to be a place of light, not a place of darkness, not a place of competitiveness, not a place of narcissism. The only thing the church has is Jesus Christ. We don't have all of these programs. It's time to get rid of the programs and go back to simply preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified, risen from the dead, Changing lives, changing people, changing, changing, changing. When the light comes, darkness has to flee. Paul said in 2 Corinthians that we have been exposed to that. It's in our hearts. And we as the church should be a light to the world. There's also a representation of this very same candlestick that was in the tabernacle that's supposed to be in us as the temple of the Holy Spirit in 2 Corinthians. And it's in the heavenly tabernacle. Look at Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5. And lightnings, bolts or flashes of lightning, and voices or sounds, and thunders, crashes or peals of thunder are coming out from the throne. And the seven torches, lamps of fire, are burning before the throne, which are the seven, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, seven spirits of God. I'm not saying there's seven different spirits. It's to show that there's the fullness in the Spirit of God. I preached a series. I will probably 
maybe go back to revisit that, the seven problems in the church and the seven responses of the Holy Spirit. When we get to the place that we realize that everything is connected, that's why when Jesus prayed, kingdom come will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that, he, that the intention is that as ambassadors for Christ, as ambassadors of the Holy Spirit, we are to be that light. So I want to move into what does it mean to live in the light? What does it mean when we come into the holy place that we are living in the light of the Holy Spirit? First of all, we are to receive power. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Many of my Pentecostal friends can quote this with me, but you will receive power, the Holy Spirit having come upon you, and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and as far as the last place of the earth. In other words, we are to be walking as living witnesses of the power of a living God. You say, well, Brother Eric, I'm not a preacher. You don't have to be a preacher, but you sure can be a witness. You can be called into court for something that you've seen, something that you directly heard, that you have an experience with whatever it is. We are to say, I've had an experience with Jesus. I may not be a preacher. I may not be in some of my mainline denominational church, but I've been with Jesus. The disciples were known not because of their occupation, but they were known they had been with Jesus. That's why when the seven sons of Sceva uh, were attempted to cast out the demon, the demon was very plain. Paul, I know in Jesus. I know I don't know you. When we get to the place that hell knows you by your name because of the light coming from you, that when you walk into a room, the demons go, I know why you're here. I don't like you. That we should be the witness that Jesus changes lives. I was lost. I was in darkness. I was bound in, in sin. But Jesus Christ came into my life. And even when I walked away, but in July of 2017, he called me back home. He put a ring on my finger. He put the robe of Jesus' righteousness on me. He put shoes for the preparation of the gospel on my feet. And he changed my life. I'll not go back. You see, when you become a witness, I've seen Jesus. I've seen him alive. I've seen the resurrected Savior. It does something inside of you. The early church did not just celebrate one Sunday a year for Easter. No, 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 no. They celebrated every day that he is alive and he's coming back. Maranatha, they said, perhaps today. Maranatha, Maranatha, because he's alive. The church should be witnesses of that power that brings the dead out of the grave alive. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul is praying for the church at Ephesus. And he says this, Ask that he might grant, you, grant to you in accordance with the riches of his glory that you be strengthened with power through his spirit, his spirit in the inner person. In other words, that he gets down deep inside of you and gives you that strength to stand, that strength to witness, that strength to pray. Notice he continues on. So that Christ may dwell, the Greek word there meaning reside, to live, have his home. That Christ is to have his home, live, reside in your heart through faith. Jesus lives here because I believe he's the son of God risen from the dead. That whole resurrection thing matters. In order that you, having been rooted and founded in love, whose love? Christ's love, the agape love. He pursued you. He found you. He saw you. He came looking for you. You were the one sheep out of the hundred that was wandering around. He came looking. He pursued you. He knew the love he had for you. That even while you were yet a sinner, while Eric was a sinner, while everybody out here was a sinner, Jesus died for us in order that you being rooted in the family of love might be strong enough to grasp together with all of the saints what is the width, the length, and height, and depth. Of what? The love of Christ. Why does that matter? In Isaiah chapter 55, he says, to strengthen your cords, build out your tent, 
Why? Because if I know the length, the depth, the width, and the height, and depth of Jesus Christ's love for me, he says, and to know the love of Christ, that surpassing knowledge, in order that you might be filled to all the fullness of God. To be filled with the fullness of God. Do you know, do you understand that you, God will let you have as much of him as you want? He didn't deny Moses to see his glory. He goes, you just can't take, see it the way you are now, so let me cover you so I can show you. But Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he said, in that day you will know that I am in him and you are in me and I am in you. We are no longer slaves, but we are, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are friends of Jesus. We are related. And he told them, today you're my child. You've been adopted. And so the more that you get hungry for God, the more you begin to make room for him. And that means you get rid of the things that you no longer need till you become hungry, desperate for him, desperate for God, desperate for the move of the Spirit, that the things of this world begin to lose their, their uh, luster. They lose their whole idea. The light begins to show the goodness of God. We sing the song, the, the goodness of God. But I wonder sometimes, do we believe what we sing? The light shows, one, what we need to get rid of to replace it with what God wants. When you bind something, you've got to release something. Do you understand that? If I bind the power of the devil in your life, I should release the power of the Spirit. If I bind the sickness in your body, I release the healing power of the, of the Lord. There comes a point that we come halfway and stop. Well, I want God, but I don't want enough that's going to make me Look funny, you're right, funny. People. I don't want him to put me in the floor. I don't want to speak with other tongues. I don't want to do all of that Pentecostal stuff. I just want to raise my hands about the shoulder and, and go, Hallelujah. Rather than saying, Lord, whatever, I just want you. And that's why when we start talking about being filled with the Spirit, Paul will talk about not letting other things rule us. He wants to not only fill us with power, but give us wisdom and guidance. Look so at John 16, and verse 7. But I tell you the truth, he says, it is better, profitable, advantageous for you that I go away. Can you imagine we've walked, they've walked with Jesus for this time on earth? They've seen him heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. He empowered them to do it. Twelve of them went out. Seventy of them went out. They all came back going, hey, look at here. The demons are subject to us through your name. He goes, you need to get excited because your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That should be what excites you. But yet they, they say, but it's to your benefit that I go away. They're like, why? He goes, because look, boys, if I don't go away, the helper, the parakletos, the one called alongside of, cannot come until I'm there. John 13, 16, going on down to verse 13 through 15. But when the one, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will speak not of himself, from himself, but he will speak whatever he will hear, and he will declare to you the things coming. That one will glorify me, and he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Now, no one could make that claim except they saw themselves as equal with God. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I say to you that he takes, I said that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. In other words, the Holy Spirit declares what the Father says to the Son, or the Son says it to the Spirit, the Spirit says it to us. So that we are witnesses. So that sometimes you may know how to pray. You know what to pray. So we come to the place that if we're standing in this light, if we're full of the Holy Spirit, if we're changed, there should be a shadow. You can't see, but on the screen behind me, every time I move, there's a shadow. And hopefully I can edit most of the shadow out. But when light falls on you, it creates a shadow. That means there has to be a source of the light, which I believe is the Holy Spirit. Notice what happened in Peter's life in Acts chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. So that they were even bringing out the sick into the wide roads and putting them on little beds and cots in order that while Peter was coming, if even his shadow might overshadow one of them, and the multitude from the cities around Jerusalem was also coming together, bringing sick ones and ones being troubled by unclean spirits who were all being cured. Why? Why were they being cured? Because the light that was shining on Peter's life created a shadow. And that shadow began to touch them because they had faith that Peter was plugged into the, the healer. 
You see, when people, the woman grabbed hold of the hem of Jesus' garment, her faith was, I just have to touch him. He became, she wasn't looking much for the healing as much as the healer. When we read about blind Bartimaeus, he was just not, he wasn't looking for a miracle. He wanted to meet the miracle worker, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. You see, sometimes we're so hung up on what we get, we forget the one that gives. We let the flesh dictate to us what we will and will not do, what we do and do not believe. It is time that we get to the place. It's only about him. It's only about his life. And that's why Jesus said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 20 and verse 22, he having said this, he breathed on them. And he says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. You know that sometimes you got to belong before you believe. They belonged to Jesus before they truly believed that he was the Son of God. You say, well, didn't Peter? Peter did, and they had a, a limited understanding. But it wasn't until he resurrected they got it. They understood it. Now they believe. They belong to Jesus. Now they believe in him. I believe there's a lot of people that think they belong to Jesus. They just don't believe in him. They belong. They'll call his name. They'll say, thank God, thank Jesus. But they're not really belong. They don't belong to him. They don't believe in him. And when the disciples began to believe in them, then it came time to move them to the next level. That's why Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 19, Paul will say, do not get drunk with wine in which is wild living. We've all seen a drunk. They don't care. They say whatever runs through their little minds, what comes out their mouth. Some are lovable drunks. Some are mean drunks. But what Paul is saying, you understand being under the control of another substance or something else. A drunk is not in control of themselves, but they are under the control of that substance or the drug or whatever. He says, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, let the Spirit be in control. He said, and you do this by speaking to each other with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. I'm reading another book where he talks about if we just focused on, I need to have the fruit of the Spirit, being demonstrated in my life to everybody around me. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, goodness, meekness, gentleness, all these things that are part of love. And if that becomes what I'm demonstrating, because I'm now demonstrating what should be the fruit, and I'm, I'm going to be preaching in it very, very soon about the 30, 60, and 100-fold of fruit-bearing. Not that you give money and you get 30, 60, 100, but what the fruit in your life being in with contact with Jesus Christ. That's why he says, don't be drunk, don't be all, but be filled with the Spirit. Let the Spirit have control. You say, well, Brother Eric, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And, and, uh, Paul, in Acts chapter 19, Paul comes to a group of about 12 people, and he says, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit, having believed? They say, we have not even heard if the Holy Spirit is given. And what they're basically saying we heard John talk about it. We didn't know what's happened yet. Some there are people in this world today that say, well, I've heard about all these miracles. I had not seen any. I've heard about this Jesus. I haven't met him. I don't know if he's, if he's shown up on this planet yet. When you get saved, yes, you get filled with the Holy Spirit. You get sealed into the day of redemption. But then when he says to be filled with power, that means that you go from just being, I'm just going to be a kid hanging out till I get to heaven, to where I want to be a witness. I've got to tell somebody. i got to tell somebody that Jesus loves them. i got to tell somebody that Jesus cares about them. i got to tell somebody that the Holy Spirit has been given to them. And when we begin to live that way, it doesn't matter about if we go to a mega church or a Noah church. It all that will matter is that you're the church. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is you that the Spirit wants to indwell and infill and let the light, as you let the Spirit burn away on the altar of God, all that's in you that doesn't need to be there, so that you can look somebody like we used to when I was growing up in church. I want you to know I am saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, and there's a fire shut up in my bones, and it wants to get out, and I can but speak what I've seen. I can but speak the things that I have seen and I have heard through Jesus Christ. So my question to you, my friend, is are you living in the light or are you living in the darkness? 
Are you filled with the Spirit? Or are you filled with death? You got to pick. The Bible says today I put before you blessing and cursing, life and death. Choose life. Your brother, you don't know what I've done in my life. You know what's going on. But he does. And he heals. And he delivers. And he saves. If you don't know him today, you listen to this podcast. Maybe you stumbled upon this, this broadcast completely by accident. But I want you to know he loves you. He cares for you. He wants to set you free. And it's very simple. You come before the throne of God and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the everlasting Son of God and that you raised Him from the dead and He is now seated at the right hand. And I believe that. I know it to be true. And I want Him to take up dwelling in my life and let His Spirit take so control that I am, won't be the person that I've ever been before, that I repent, I change. If you're sick in body, Father, I believe that the same blood that saves is the same blood that heals. Whatever you need is found in the light of the Holy Spirit as He reveals Scripture in God's Word to you. Can we pray? Father God, we thank You so much for Your love, Your mercy, Your grace, and Your glory. I pray, God, that You'll use this Word today to change somebody, to empower somebody to live and walk with You. And we rejoice for those who are healed today. We rejoice with those who are saved today. And we rejoice with your people as we cry, Maranatha, perhaps today you return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll be right back in just a few moments. Hey, thank you for joining us today. Don't forget that at any time that you can email me right here at pastorstansberry at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you, maybe seeing some of you this past week here in Dalton, Georgia. So until next week, this is Dr. Eric Sainsbury saying, may grace and peace be multiplied to you and your family as we hope to make you a disciple who has a living letter to a dying world. We'll see you next week.